Hello. Happy Tuesday, everybody. I love everybody in the chat greeting each other. It is a good day. People are still kind of funneling in here, but we are so excited. So this workshop is the first in our series about the client journey and the client experience. So welcome. We are so excited to have you guys here this morning. Um, morning for me. I'm in San Francisco. I know people are tuning in from all over the place. Um, so this first workshop is all about first impressions. You guys are already chiming in all about that. You can't wait to learn more. We love it. So it's all about first impressions and making sure that you are wowing all of your potential clients from the very first moment they're coming into contact with your brand and your business. So really excited to dive into that more. So let's go ahead and get started here. Um, hopefully you guys saw my note up in the chat way, way back up before everybody started chiming in and saying hello. There's a message from me. Um, so it's, it's like the longest message in the chat. So if you scroll up, that's kind of your little help guide to today's workshop. If you ever have any audio or visual issues, the best line of defense is just to refresh this page and that'll get you synced back up really quickly. You might have to find an unmute button or a play button when you do that, but that should put you right back on track. And the other note that I wrote there was this will be recorded. So if you want to come back to it and watch it later, the best option is actually just to bookmark this page. So this URL up at the top of the screen there um, for the broadcast will actually turn into the recording afterwards. So if you want to get back to it, um, super easy to just bookmark that right now. Okay, so you might be wondering who I am. So my name is Mac. I'm part of our product education team here at HoneyBook. I've been with the company since 2017, which is four years, which is actually really long in startup world. Um, might not sound like long to some of you guys, but it's a real good long time. Um, I always say that my superpower is um, organization. So hopefully that'll come across today. Um, and then I want to invite Laura up here. So let me get Laura up on screen. Laura is going to be co-hosting with me today. Um, hopefully you guys have had a chance to check out her work. She is amazing. She is a HoneyBook Pro. Um, which means that she is a total expert on the HoneyBook system. She's actually been working with the HoneyBook program for longer than I've been a HoneyBook employee. So she knows the system super well. Hi, Laura. Hi. <laughs> so yeah, just go ahead and introduce yourself. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my slides. You can pull up your slides if you want. Um, and go ahead and introduce yourself to everybody here. Oh, let my screen share. Perfect. Okay, cool. All right, guys. So I'm Laura. If you don't know who I am, I have been a wedding photographer for eight years as well as a brand photographer. That's what I'm more recently pivoting into as well as a workflow strategist and business coach for the last about six years. So I have been a HoneyBook educator from the very, very beginning of the program. I think I was sitting in the San Francisco office when they were starting it because I was there for the Rising Tide retreat like way back in 2016, I think, or something. So I am I'm a very proud HoneyBook user, have been on it from the early days, and I'm also one of the HoneyBook pros, so if anybody ever needs help with HoneyBook, I don't work for them. I have my own business, but um, love the platform, love their community, and everything they stand for, so I'm always here to chat and love on HoneyBook and help you get set up with HoneyBook. So I really am on a mission to, as an educator, to help people find more freedom in their life and their business and this can be all encompassing with your creativity your purpose your time your finances and your overall lifestyle because i am somebody who had this story of going from super burnt out and unpassionate about my business because i was just on this hamster wheel of overwork to having a life and being more balanced and a lot of that came from utilizing HoneyBook and getting systems in place and things like what we're going to start to touch on today and all of the other workshops. I'm sure we'll keep expanding on this, but 
that is a little bit about me. And so if you want to connect, I'll have a little connection slide later. And of course, we'll have time for questions at the end as well. Me and Mac are going to be ping ponging back and forth between like our sections of the, the slides and the content. So I will tell you what I'm going to cover is mainly three things. So we're going to go through number one, the pre-inquiry process and what potential clients are looking for before they even contact you. Number two, how your contact form is going to affect your client experience and how to optimize this tool into your overall process. And number three, we're going to talk about this concept I call the leaky bucket and how to plug holes in your inquiry process and your overall client experience that could be costing you time, clients, and money. And some really cool examples, I think, of how you can wow your clients that contact you from step one. So the first part of that all happens in the pre-inquiry process. And before I even get into what I mean by the pre-inquiry process, I want to talk a little bit about what impacts the client experience and why we're all here. And in, <laughs> in short, it is pretty much everything that your brand stands for all the way down from the information you provide on your website, that is part of your client experience, to what's on your contact form, to how you respond in that first email, to what those touch points are throughout your whole client journey. And so first I want to talk about how this begins with the pre-inquiry process. And that really just means that the client experience you're providing before somebody ever even fills out that contact form. So before the inquiry lands on your email account, it's really important that we are giving people a service that makes them want to take that next step. And as somebody who teaches workflow and systems and stuff like that, I just want you guys to keep in mind that every part of your process should really just have one call to action to the next step. So the pre-inquiry process most of the time is happening on your website, your social media, things like Instagram, your feed, your stories, stuff like that. And I know not everybody on here is a photographer, of course, but one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite educators, Mary Morantz, she says, we don't want a business that says a photographer is a photographer is a photographer. We want our potential clients to land on or our corner of the web and say, you, you're the photographer I need. And of course, you can insert your type of business into that sentence and it applies across the board. So during this pre-inquiry process, you got to think that the main core thing Thing that your clients are doing in this process is research. And I'm going to talk a little bit about millennial marketing in a few slides because I think as service providers, a lot of us are marketing to millennials. Now that might not be across the board, of course, but I think that is a predominant industry of where a lot of marketing is directed in general in the world at this point. So this research phase is going to encompass mainly five different areas. And these are the things that you wanna keep in mind during this pre-inquiry process and making sure that they are consistent on your website, your social media, and all those touch points where you might be interacting with clients before that contact form. So those are gonna be style, price, personality, connection, and experience. And here is how we are going to you know, essentially do this during the pre-inquiry process. And of course, if you guys have any questions, I can try to answer them as we go, but we'll also have time at the end to answer questions. So feel free to pop in the chat. I have it over on my screen on the right side. But essentially, we are in this millennial age of marketing, and we need to be focused on, number one, delivering a great customer experience. And I think that a lot of people seem to associate client experience with more of the pretty fluffy things like client gifts or things like that, things wrapped in a bow. But the reality is that your customer experience is every touch point you have with your clients. So this is going to mean every email that you send to them, every questionnaire you send to them, client education that you can give them. And I'm going to give you guys an example in a little bit but we really wanna be focused in every interaction to 
give our clients a good experience from beginning to end. And something that I talk about with my husband a lot, he's an architect and he has so many clients that don't understand the difference between what the architect does and what the contractor does. And on his end, he'll be like, oh, you know, why don't they get this? And I'm like, you got to understand that this is their first time ever putting an addition on their house or building their house or whatever it is. And so your job as your service provider, you need to assume that they don't know any ins and outs of your service. So you want to be the person educating them and sending emails, sending questionnaires, sending any type of touch point, whether it's a blog, a newsletter, stuff like that, to help them have this great experience. And now all of this can be happening during your pre-inquiry process. It can happen on your Instagram reels. It can happen in your feed. It can happen on your blog, in a newsletter. So that is number one, a great experience. Number two is building a relationship with our customers. And this can happen, yes, after they are, of course, a client. We can send questionnaires to get to know them. We can send gifts. We can have meetings with them. But we can also do this in our marketing by just showing up. And I'm sure that there are people that you guys follow on Instagram, on Clubhouse, on Facebook, on TikTok, on all of these things. And you literally feel like they are a friend. Like I have people that I follow on Instagram that have become household names in mine and my husband's conversations that I have never met in person. And I'll send them things and be like, hey, this made me think of you. And I'm like, does this make me weird? Like I feel like a stalker. Um, but you can be that person for your clients as well. And number three is showing what makes you different. And I don't know what industry you are in, but as a wedding photographer, I am based in northern New Jersey. And if I go on the knot, there are 5,000 registered wedding photographers on the knot within a 100 mile radius. And that is a lot of competition. I mean, I'm all about community over competition, but we all need to make a living. And I think something that is so important is having brand differentiators that help show what makes you different. And I think one of my coaching clients does this so well. She is has a background in brand strategy, but she's a photographer. And one of the things she's always showcasing is her love for dogs and bringing those to bringing your dogs to your session or to your wedding. And she actually gives a portion of her profits from every session to the dog rescue where she got her dog. And so it's attracting clients who have those same interests. And so I always like to think of what those brand differentiators could be that you are posting about that are just connection points that you might want to have with your potential future clients. And now the fourth thing is proving your value. So this, I think, really comes through your website copy. And one of the ways that I do this, I'll actually show you on, I made a little GIF on one of the future slides. So I'll kind of get into that in a little bit. Um, but we also want to set expectations through education and have a consistent brand. And I'm going to elaborate on all of this a little bit more. But the last thing we want to do, and HoneyBook really, really helps with this, is make your customer journey streamlined and easy for them. Like, I am getting married this June. I got engaged December 2018. So we have the whole pandemic wedding situation going on. And I still have 50% of my vendors ask me to mail them a paper contract and come to their office to pay a deposit. And I was like, I'm not coming an hour to pay a deposit. Like, please get a CRM and send me an invoice or uh, like, I don't even have a checkbook anymore for personal checking. And so I would definitely stress in this millennial age of marketing, people want easy. They don't want to be mailing you things. Of course, you guys are on a HoneyBook webinar. So that is something that is, um, thank you, Jada. Um, so that's something, of course, that HoneyBook can help with. And if you, I know most people who are registered are HoneyBook users, but if you are not, if you don't know what HoneyBook is, it's essentially a client relationship management tool that allows you to manage your projects from start to finish with everything from contracts to invoices to emails, questionnaires, brochures, client communication, basically every single thing you need to do to provide a top tier service. And it makes it so easy on the client end. Personally, as a bride, the best client experiences were the 
vendors who used HoneyBook because I was like, all right, perfect. I can view my contract at any time. I can, you know, send my, you know, signed contract through here, send my invoices through here and all of that. So before we even talk about utilizing this and Max going to be screen sharing some things, we need to really focus on that pre-inquiry work. So first one is your first impression experience. And this is where I'm just going to kind of go in depth a little bit more about all those bullet points on that last side. So number one, your first impression, this is going to be on either your website or your social media, like I said. Some things, especially for the millennial age of marketing, you want to have a very easy to navigate website. So make it clear how to contact you, how to find your services, how to find that, you know, um, the median price point for your services. Don't make people hunt for information. So just having a very easy, clear, navigatable website, I don't even know if that's a word, um, but have an easy to navigate website on desktop and mobile. I would say 80, 80 to 90% of people are searching for vendors and service providers on mobile. So make sure that your website is very mobile accessible. That is something that should be super high on your priority list if it is not already. Number two is I would recommend describing who your client, ideal client is on your website. And this is going to come in through the copywriting and things that you do. And I have on my wedding website what my ideal Loralee couple looks like, what my ideal brand client looks like, because that is going to attract or repel people that I really want to work with or that might not be the best fit for me, but might be a good fit for one of my friends. And so I love doing outdoor mountaintop weddings, which is kind of comical because I live in New Jersey and there's not a whole lot of mountains here. Um, but I have that on my site. And so I am attracting a lot of New York City couples who are getting married outdoors in the Hudson Valley region of New York. And I you know, get to have those outdoor things. And so I'm always putting on my site who I want to attract and the, also the work that is going to attract that client. So another couple tips here would be having a defined brand and consistent style. So you want to think of your entire brand. It's not just a logo or anything like that. Your brand is every single thing that your clients see and how people perceive you and what they say about you. So your branding should be consistent on your social media to your website, to your newsletter, you want to make sure that you have this certain aesthetic or style, even your words that you use, so that you can be consistent and attract those people. And people will see like, oh, I see that. And I know that, you know, HoneyBook has a very defined brand. If you, you know that they're blue and yellow and they have the rocket ship little icons and stuff like that. And so coming up with those brand differentiators or themes and consistent style is something that's really going to help that first impression experience. And I remember me and my husband just went to a Alexis, it's Loralee Photography. Um, me and my husband just went to a cheese bar, which is like my dream come true. I always say if I could choose my fate, it would be by eating too much cheese. And we just went to this cheese bar and the menu was white text on a printed like wood <laughs> screenshot wood texture background and I could literally I have 2020 vision and I could barely read anything on that menu and I was like oh wow this is like really bad branding and like the fonts were all different from the menu to what was on their wall to their website and I was just like I can't even tell if these are <laughs> the same business and so other than consistency also make sure that it's very easy to read your website and all that. And of course, being consistently posting on your social media so people know what to expect from you and when to expect things. And on your website, just make it very easy for them to contact you. Number two, I already kind of elaborated on this, but to recap, just show up in your marketing. So have on your about page, make sure you have a photo of you. And I would also 
recommend that that photo has your eyes looking at the camera. It is instantly going to increase their trust with you. I have, I do a lot of business coaching for my brand clients as well. And sometimes they always like the photos that they're like looking down into the side and they look really beautiful and they'll use that on their about page. And I'm like, nope, you got to change that. You need it to um, make it so that your eyes are looking at the camera. So make sure you have a headshot on your social media and your website and show up in your social media feeds, especially if you are somebody who needs to have content over and over again. People want to know the humans behind the business and they want to know the why. So make sure that you are showing up your face on your Instagram stories, but also just photos of you in your feed so people can start to connect with you before they even contact you. And then Something that I used to do a lot, and this always shocked me, like if you guys have ever done the Instagram top nine at the end of the year, then you know, if you do post photos of you, they always seem to be the ones that are most linked. And this used to happen to me with my blog posts as well. I would write personal like weekend recaps, and they always had the most reads, the most shares. I was like, do people really care that I went to an ice castle? Like, this is crazy. And so if blogging or writing is your strong suit, consider writing personal blog posts that can help connect clients to you because longtime readers of blogs can turn into clients and just having a small blurb on your about page and showing up in your pricing guide as well. I think that's something that I had implemented a couple years ago and saw an increase of people booking consultations of just me showing up in my pricing guide. So just remember that your potential clients or current clients, your followers, they're not seeing everything that you post. So if you feel like you're being redundant, it's probably not redundant. Like you can share the same thing on your homepage and a little bit on your about page and in your pricing guide and in your brochures and keep sharing these messages about what your brand is all about because people are not seeing all of those places. There's just way too much content out there. So it is totally okay to be repetitive in the content that you put out. And just remember, your reputation is built from a foundation of relationships. Your brand isn't what you say it is, it is what others say it is. And then, of course, um, number three on that main bullet point list was differentiating yourself. And I will just kind of explain how I do this on my own Lorely Creative site for brand photography. So I do brand photography for small business owners. And I think my unique value proposition is that I'm also a business coach. So when I'm taking brand photos, I'm not just a portrait photographer with a camera who's taking headshots of you or taking a photo of you with a laptop or something like that, that you see all over the place. I'm taking very, very purposeful approach to your brand photography and thinking through all the content that you might post on your blog, your podcast, your social media for the next 90 days to one year out. So I'm thinking of caption ideas and all of these things. And most brand photographers that don't have that strategy or like business strategy background aren't going to be thinking that way. So that's just my differentiator for that service that I do. So I would really encourage you guys to think about what sets you apart from other service providers who do what you do. And even if it is just a like personal personality thing, like my friend who adopted her dog, like that is a differentiator that sets her apart and it attracts other dog lovers to her brand. So it does not necessarily need to be a business skill. Just think of these brand connection points that sets you apart and makes you different or makes you memorable. And then number four here, I would highly recommend that you guys are capturing testimonials from every single client, unless of course you know that they for some reason did not have a good experience, then probably wouldn't ask them. But I ask every single client for a testimonial and I ask them to post on Google, my Facebook, and if it's a wedding client, the not wedding wire and I, and Zola, I think. So I just link, they have to write it once and then I give them all of the links to my testimonials and they could just copy paste. You can also incentivize people to actually do it by giving them a Starbucks gift card or something like that. I feel like people do anything for Starbucks gift cards. So 
make sure you are getting testimonials, especially on Google, because it'll help with your SEO and help with like local listings and stuff like that. And just make it very easy for them to post the reviews. And then you can repurpose those in so many different ways. Like you don't need to just let it live on Google forever. You can create a cute little Canva graphic with their testimonial and their headshot and share their story. And that's something that we do. We used to do a lot more in Laura Lee Creative and I want to get back to it, but we would take our student testimonials from our and show their headshot and we would share their before and after story and their testimonial and we would do a whole Instagram story you know story about them and their life and their business and stuff like that and like showcase them as this really awesome student success story and it was also a way to share testimonials so you can get really creative with sharing testimonials and it is not spammy at all like people want to especially Millennials like they want to and I can say this from experience I am a millennial People want to read about other people's experience, and that's going to be one thing. If you have 500 reviews versus somebody's five, like you are automatically going to go up in their eyes as somebody trustworthy. So it really helps with the trust factor. And then number five is set expectations and educate about your process. So you can see here on the right side of this slide that I made a little gif of my website on our workflow. So we have a done for you workflow service where we create custom workflows for HoneyBook users and then implement them into your account. And it's like beastly. Like some of these workflows are 16 pages, single space in a Google Doc. It's awesome. And I really wanted to make sure that I was setting expectations and educating people about the process on the site so that we didn't have to have a 30 minute conversation on Zoom about what we do, who we help, all of that. So just educate people about your process. And this can also happen afterwards through your inquiry email, through a specific section on your site. It could be in your pricing guide or your brochure. It can be through educational blog posts throughout the workflow. I send about 12 client education emails in my wedding workflow process for my couples from everything from why they should have an unplugged wedding, how to decide whether or not they want to have a first look. I send vendor recommendations. So I am just assuming that they've never read anything about wedding planning or wedding photography before. And I am doing everything I can to provide education so that they feel totally taken care of and have a stress-free experience from beginning to end. So my goal is always to go above and beyond in communication. So that is mostly all of part one. And I want to give you guys a quick take action list for this section to make sure you have a killer about page on your website. And you can screenshot this slide if you want. Use words and copy on your website that is going to attract or repel your ideal client. Update your website as needed to attract or repel dream clients based on the tips in this and then add a section to your website for your ideal client. So a lot of things about your ideal client, of course, also I didn't add all the action items that we talked about, but being consistent on social media, making sure that your brand is consistent across the board, adding those communication touch points, but we'll get into that a little more in a future section. Um, and now most of all of these things are happening before a prospective client even reaches out. And what happens next is going to be them filling out your contact form. So this is going to be where I stop screen sharing and Mac is going to share with you guys about, I don't know how to stop screen sharing. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm like, I got it. So. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, so let's dive into the HoneyBook contact form. So this is, the next, you know, we've talked about the whole kind of first impression that happens before people ever get into really starting to communicate with you. So how do you get that information into the HoneyBook system is kind of what we're trying to address here with the contact form. So the idea with the HoneyBook contact form is obviously that it will replace whatever contact form you have on your website right now, or really wherever your inquiries are coming from. Laura mentioned social media, um, even review sites, like really anywhere you're getting your leads coming from, 
the HoneyBook contact form can funnel that information into the HoneyBook system so that you can start to follow up with those people either automatically, like she was kind of alluding to, which um, just for your guys' knowledge, some of the later webinars in these series, specifically workshop three and workshop four that we're doing, we'll really dive into the workflow process a little bit in more detail. So if workflows or automations is something that interests you, those workshops are gonna be fabulous for you to check out. But the contact form is really the first step in enabling you to do that. So that's why we're starting with this concept. So when you're inside of your HoneyBook account, all you have to do to get to the contact form is pop up to tools and contact form. And there are a number of different kind of best practices that you can implement when you're using the HoneyBook contact form to make sure that you're kind of ticking all those boxes that Laura was mentioning. So things like setting expectations. Most people don't realize that they can actually do that in their contact form or, um, you know, differentiating yourself, making sure that people know they're going to get the best bang for their buck. They can relate to you, um, seeing who you are, putting that brand voice in your contact form. I feel like that's a big step that gets missed by people. So something like this at the top of your contact form, just briefly kind of differentiating yourself, making sure that they understand the value behind what you're providing, and then maybe some simple text at the bottom setting expectations for next steps. So here I've put an example of, you're gonna receive an email as soon as you submit this form with a link to schedule a call. So the call to action here, like Laura was saying, we wanna have one call to action for every step that we're pushing your clients towards. The main call to action here is to submit the contact form. But the next step is they'll receive an email and they need to schedule their 30 minute complimentary consultation with you. Okay, so setting clear actionable steps for your clients, letting them know what's to come, what they can do next, but what they need to do right now. Um, getting to know more details about them. But I always advise too, to just keep the contact form. It depends on your business model, but I always advise to keep these relatively short. Um, this is not meant to be their whole life story. You don't, I mean, worst case scenario, you scare someone off because your contact form is like this whole booklet that they need to fill out before they can even get in touch with you. So you know, maybe save some of the questions that you would normally want to ask on a contact form for that initial consult call. Maybe that's a point where you can realize um, that there's, you know, a bottleneck in your business because the contact form is too long. And maybe some of those questions are better suited for an in-person face-to-face meeting or a Zoom call or something like that. So just addressing your process um, and knowing your process really well and being able to identify those bottlenecks is really helpful too. So um, I'm not going to go into too many details of how you set up the contact form because we have tons of resources in the HoneyBook Help Center on how to do that. More so, we just want to go into the business best practices. But um, I would love, we're going to get um, Julia Bird up here, actually. So when you guys registered for the webinar, you might have noticed that there's the opportunity to um, participate in the webinar where we're going to be taking a look at someone um, a HoneyBook member. So I'm going to invite Julia up on screen right now. And then I'm going to start sharing her website so we can take a look at her actual contact form. All righty. Let me make sure this is working. Okay, cool. So this is while we wait for Julia to get up here. Hey, I see how it's are you working guys? right now. Hi, Julia. Very good. Thank good. you. Good. How are you? Good. So do you want to kind of just briefly introduce the audience to what you do and yeah, who you so are I'm and where you're tuning in Houston, from? I'm just in Houston, Texas right now. Um, and my business is I do college admissions essay coaching for rising seniors. Um, and so I help them um, from every part of the essay writing process, from brainstorming to proofreading the final product. So I can come in at, a, at several different points in the process. Sometimes it's from start to finish. Sometimes they just want somebody to read it at the end. Somebody wants just help with the brainstorming and then they're on their own. So um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of it. Like usually the person who's reaching out to me is usually the parent but then, and they're paying the bills, but my client right. is actually really the student. Definitely. Okay, wonderful. So yeah, I wanna just quickly, I've got your contact form here, which is embedded on your website. And then I also have your HoneyBook instance pulled up so that we can awesome. take a look from the HoneyBook site as well. 
Yeah. So right off the bat, um, we've got, you know, we're meeting the need in that um, a little bit of a shorter contact form, which is great. We're not going to be scaring anybody off with the length of this. Um, and we've got some key questions. You know, we need to know the parents that we're going to be communicating with. We'd like to know some information about the student we'll be working with. Very important to know their year in school. What are they hoping to gain from working with you? And then how did they hear about you? I think all of these questions are super valuable in the initial intake process. Now, one thing that strikes me when I look at this, I'm thinking I want to look at her HoneyBook account because I want to see if these questions are tied to what I consider to be smart fields in the HoneyBook system, which means that HoneyBook is going to be basically working a little bit harder for you. So there's not as much manual work on your side. So when we hop in your account, the first thing that I was doing is I was hovering over each field. And what I'm looking for is these two little circles interconnected, because that's telling me that these are linked to a smart field. And once we start getting down here to student name and student email, I know the HoneyBook system well enough to know that those couldn't be connected to something. So that's fine. But students um, current year in school, I was thinking that this would be a good opportunity to actually connect to project types. So project types is one way in the HoneyBook system that you can categorize the type of work that you do. And the easiest way I think for you to categorize your work is grade in school, year in school. So project types I think would be a great solution here when we're talking about awesome. um, their year. It's a little bit tricky though, because project types cannot be edited from the contact form itself. So what anyone who is, you know, if this sounds like this makes sense for anybody else's business model too, the actual first thing that you wanna do in order to edit your project types is to come down into company settings and pop into the preferences section. So this is actually where those project types live. So for your instance, Julia, you would be coming in here and clicking this edit button. And rather than just having these two options, I think it might be better to actually distinguish okay. their year awesome. in school. And then that way, when they fill out the contact form, okay. they'll be able to select that. And even further too, I know Laura will back me up on this also, the project types is the key component of how you set up a workflow. That's kind of a pro tip in HoneyBook. It's not super obvious. A lot of people don't know it, but project types is what connects the inquiry okay. to an automation process. So for example, if you wanted your grade 12 students to receive a different kind of flow of emails or information or brochures or anything like that, than maybe a grade nine client or lower, you could differentiate those things in your workflows and say, all my grade 12 clients I'm going to send them this step of, you know, series of content or messaging, whether it be a brochure or an email or anything like that. So that's another reason Perfect. why I saw that as an opportunity for you. So definitely recommend updating those project types. And then the way once you edit those project types, the way you would add the project type question here is by clicking the plus button and you're going to go to the suggested question types. And this will show you, so the two little circles that are interconnected that I was looking for, those are all basically the suggested question type options. So this is showing you how many you're using in your contact form versus how many are not being used. So maybe even something like phone number could be helpful to include. Um, project type is what we were just talking about. And actually later on this, how did you hear about me question is actually okay. perfect to use your lead source awesome. um, suggested question for. So I really recommend adding that lead source question and basically just replacing that, how did you hear about me with that? Because the lead source question actually even ties into a report in HoneyBook that'll tell you where all your different leads are coming from, how many of them actually end up booking you, um, and lots of other information without you even having to lift a finger because your clients will just put that into the contact form and HoneyBook. Can I ask you a question about that? So one reason I didn't do it is because, um, you know, I have a, you know, if it was a referral, I wanted to know like who it was. I didn't think I could have kind of like a check boxes and like a fill in the blank, or maybe I can. 
Yeah, so there's kind of a workaround for it. So first of all, lead sources actually can be customized in the same places project types that we were just looking at. So if there are like three specific industry referrals that you consistently work with or something like that, and you wanted to just add them to the list, you could do that. Another option is just to have other as an option on the lead source list. And then you would just have a follow-up question that isn't tied to the field that would just say, if you okay. select other, you know, who did who? refer you. Yeah. Perfect. Totally makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then the other thing that Laura and I were talking about when we were taking a look at your contact form is maybe adding some content up at the beginning of the contact form. Um, I which, <laughs> yeah, I didn't. You know, when I saw your example, I'm like, I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, if you hit the plus button, you'll it drops you off. It defaults to dropping you off in the custom question types, which I think is probably how you ended up with fewer of those smart fields being used in your contact form, Julia. I think majority of people, that's what happens. So I always recommend when you go to add a question, your first stops should be looking at the suggested question types, seeing how many of those kind of fit the bill for what you need to collect from the client, because those are gonna be the working smarter, not harder types of questions for you. And then the other option you'll see here is content. So this might look familiar to you guys if you're used to using the HoneyBook brochure file, you could add um, an image with some text maybe, and then of course you can always drag and drop the order. So we could put this at the beginning, you could have a headshot and then a description of what it is you do. So awesome. what I was thinking here on your homepage, I love this little blip. Like I think we could reuse this blip on the contact page. Obviously people can see it on the homepage here, but I think reiterating it on the contact form and maybe including your headshot on the um, on this image would be a fabulous way to start. But I know, Laura, this is more of your strong suit. So do you have suggestions for her too? Um, I would say using a kind of problem differentiator in that little bird would be great if you want a like, specific example. I don't know verbatim what mine says, but on my contact form for like workflow clients, I will say like, if you're ready to turn your business from hot mess to well-oiled machine, like me and my team can't wait to help you or something like that. So like using that paragraph from your homepage, if you're like, if you are ready to tell your story in a unique way or whatever, I can't wait to help you. So just using whatever that problem is, like, I mean, you're an essay coach, so you're going to wordsmith it way better than me. <laughs> um, but, yeah, just like using that like problem agitation because you want to think that when they hit the contact form on your site, that is yet another place that you should be qualifying them and showing the differentiation of your service. Because envision nobody reading anything else on your website and just automatically being like, oh yeah, I need I need an essay coach. I'm just gonna go to the contact form. They might not have read anything about you, anything about your services. So just like a little blurb, that's something we actually just added to all our contact forms. And I feel like our inquiries have increased as well and just been more qualified than in the past. And then one more random thing that I was thinking of, if, and just for anybody, but we have services that have like, different services within the service. So for brand photography, I have two hour, four hour, six, eight quarterly, bi-yearly or monthly. So I want to know when people are reaching out what one they're interested in. So I have a whole brand photography contact form with just a checkbox because then I can use, you know, oh, you're interested in four hour, you're interested in quarterly. Let's talk about that in the consult. And then I have that lead source linked on the very bottom. And I just write, this is for internal purposes. Please use the drop down menu to choose and choose brand photography as your service interest. And I do that so I can connect it to the brand inquiry form because I use a different inquiry form for each of my services or different contact form for each of my three main services. Um, so that's just like my little workaround if anybody needs to like visually see that in action you can i think my website's linked somewhere in the chat box but if that's something for you too if you have like different essay services um that's because i know you had essay services and business consulting that was my little workaround because i had multiple contact forms so perfect right and just to yeah. show you guys too the multiple contact forms live over here so sometimes another piece that gets lost is this left hand menu so this is where 
So this is how Julia got her text to be a different color as well. She went over here to the design section and changed colors and fonts. Um, but if you wanted to add multiple contact forms, all you have to do is click in here and you can add a new contact form. So that's what Laura is referencing right now. Awesome, guys. Um, the last little bit that I want to show before I pass it back to Laura is just this direct link option down here. So, Julia, I don't know, are majority of your leads coming through your website, would you say, or do you get people on social media or emailing you or anything like that? I would say the most are coming through Facebook right now. Okay. So. So Do I definitely you, have that direct link on there. Okay, fabulous. Okay, great. So what we're talking about here, the direct link option, you guys, um, this is basically a standalone page that will show your contact form. So rather than redirecting your clients to your website, um, where the call to action might not be as clear, which you know we've already been hyping up today, we want the call to action to be very clear, especially with something like a Facebook page or an Instagram. They're already kind of getting a feel for your business offerings. The call to action from that, I mean, that's almost serving like your website in itself, right? So the call to action from any social media page should absolutely be to inquire. And the easiest way to do that is to use this direct link URL um, to send them over to a contact form so they can just, they don't have any distractions. They're not on your website trying to figure out where to contact you or something like that. They're just right on the contact form itself and they could submit the form this way. So um, if you are like Julia and your leads are coming through social media, this direct link option is really great. You can add it to a link tree um, or have it in your bio as well. Yeah. I've done both of those. So good. I'm glad I'm doing something right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you are. No, you're definitely on the right path. Um, I think just those suggested question types can be a little tricky and adding yeah. a content block is not the most obvious step in the world. And I think it could make a difference too. So that's awesome. Thank you right. so much. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. I right. appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, of course. I'm going to pass okay. it back to Laura. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Okay. All right. Okay, um, so we got that down. All right, so now let me hold on. I want to get the oh no, did that just go away? Yeah, do you want me to stop your video or do, how can I help? <laughs> no, I got it. I just I was trying to see the the chat and the slides at the same time. Okay, perfect. Okay. All right. Part three that we're going to go into is what I call the leaky bucket. And this is something I am so passionate about teaching about because all of us have leaky holes in our bucket. And I'm going to get into what this concept means in a second. But what we're really going to talk about here is whether you are providing the best experience you can to potential customers. And I want to kick this off first with an analogy of going to a restaurant. Now, maybe it's been a while since some of us have actually been to a restaurant, but of course in our lifetime, we have all been to a restaurant before, I hope. So this analogy will hopefully make sense to everybody. So I want you to imagine that restaurant A and restaurant B have literally equivalent food deliciousness factor. And restaurant A, they are lacking a little bit in client experience. So it takes forever for them to actually bring your water to the table, to even bring you a menu. There's not any warm, fluffy rolls on the table, which my husband honestly hates. He's, he's a big fan of rolls. It takes a long time to get seated. The server has to constantly be flagged down to if you need uh, more water or a drink or utensils or a napkin or something like that. It just they're, you're, they're never proactive. They don't check in on how your food is doing ever. And it takes forever to actually get the food once you actually order it. Now, mind you, restaurant A, again, has delicious food. But these are kind of all the issues and the leaky holes that they have in their client experience and their process. And now restaurant B, they have all of these awesome client experience factors coming into play here that really make you want to rave about this experience. So they actually have the server come over, they educate you on the menu and the wine that goes best with your entree. 
There are warm, fluffy rolls waiting for you on the table. They immediately bring you to your seat. There's no wait time, and they already have your water filled. They fill your water and your wine as soon as it's getting low, and you don't have to flag them down. Like, I'm totally that person. I don't know if waiters and waitresses and servers, like, get annoyed by this, but I'm totally that person that hates, like, flagging people down. I feel, like, so awkward. So I always appreciate when people are very proactive about the water or wine or whatever being low. So that is one thing they've got going on. They check in with you frequently to see how you're doing, how they're, how you're enjoying the food, if they can get you anything else. And Restaurant B also surprises you with free dessert at the end of the night because you happen to mention when you made the reservation that it was your anniversary. And now these are both actual instances from my life. In the past couple months, me and my husband went on our eight-year anniversary dinner to this amazing French restaurant. And we went down the street to an amazing Italian restaurant, wonderful food, never got the menu, never got rolls. Our appetizer didn't come. And like, we, yes, we'll go back there because it's like three minutes away from our house and they have good food. But I'm like, I will not be writing a Yelp review. I will not be telling my friends about this place with the French restaurant. Anybody, anytime any of my friends are like, oh, do you have any recommendations for like a good date night or whatever? I'm like, oh my gosh, you need to go to this place. It's amazing. And so this is also what is happening in your business's client experience. And these restaurants are a really great example for what I call the leaky bucket. So I want you to imagine that you have this this bucket is your business and you're trying to fill the bucket with water and you keep losing water because there's like four to five holes in your bucket and you try to fix the holes with some duct tape and it temporarily temporarily works but as the tape wears down water starts to leak out at the seams again and the process happens all over and when you have holes in your bucket what's happening is you are leaving money on the table you'll be wasting time and you'll end up losing potential clients or repeat clients. So it's important to inspect every part of your client journey from pre-inquiry all the way through the end of your service to see where you might be losing time, money, clients, and referrals. And for today, we're just going to focus on the holes that you might have in your inquiry process. So I want you guys to ask yourself these questions, almost like a scoring assessment mechanism for how you might be able to improve your inquiry process. But question number one, is your initial point of contact with your inquiry converting them to a consult over 50% of the time? If not, you probably need to in update your copy in that first email that you send or do something that you are standing out, which question number two, are you standing out amongst potential competitors in your inquiry process? Now, the way that I love doing this, especially for my wedding clients is, or like potential wedding clients is calling as soon as I have availability when that inquiry comes in. And this is like a two minute phone call. It's just like, hey, I got your inquiry because it's a lot harder to go somebody that you've talked to on the phone for two minutes than it is to just somebody who sent you an email, especially when they might be sending out to multiple different service providers. So that is something to ponder. Are you standing out in any way amongst potential competitors in the inquiry process or that initial email? Number three, are you making it easy to schedule a consult with you? And if you're not, HoneyBook has a scheduler that you can plug into that initial email that'll make it way easier. This goes back to millennial marketing. I don't know if it's just me or if other millennials feel this way, but scheduling is the bane of my existence. I hate it so much if people are like, oh, pick a time that works for you. I'm like, can you just send me a link? Like, I don't want to go back and forth, especially if I'm on my phone. So I use... Um, kind of a mix between my two businesses, the scheduler and Calendly, and people can just pick what is available on my Google Calendar within set parameters that I set. And number four, are you leaving money on the table because you don't have a follow-up system in place? Now, I have been a business coach for a very long time, like going on six years now. I've coached hundreds of creative entrepreneurs, and one of the first things that we go through on coaching calls and this just is kind of happenstance that we start here. It's not like part of my process, but we always go through the inquiry workflow. And I'm like, all right, well, how many times are you following up with people? And most of the time people say zero and I'm, or maybe one. And it'll just be like a generic follow-up like, hey, are you still interested in 
brand design and it's like very like weak like oh I'm like kind of like hiding behind the couch I don't want to actually ask or bother you um but you are leaving money on the table and you are also leaving your potential clients like in the dark because they're reaching out to you because they want what you provide so it's not annoying if you are a good fit for them to follow up with them I follow up with wedding and brand clients um, three days after the inquiry is received, five days, seven days, and 14 days is when I close the inquiry if they haven't answered by that point. And this is something that I am very strategic with in my actual emails of just hitting different unique value propositions. And it's almost like a sales page broken up into six emails or just a a sales sequence, like if you were to ever launch a product or something like that. And so you want to make sure that you have a really good follow-up system in place. And you can do that when you connect your contact form to your inquiry workflow, you will be able to add emails in there at a automated cadence of like three days after, five days after, all of that. And then if they didn't respond to the first one, you can send those follow-ups. And remember our call to action here, if this is how your process works, is to get them on a console. So we don't wanna be like, do these 20 things and look at all these cool things I can do. You don't need to go into the features or anything like that. I would just recommend like, Uh, I'm going to actually dissect a good first inquiry email, but remember that we're just trying to get them to the call to the actual like closing the sale process or whatever your consultation is. Um, And then um, the last question here to ask yourself is do your consultations themselves need work? So this is something that I would definitely recommend using HoneyBook Report reports for is that you can see how many leads you're getting and what the percentage is that converted to sales. So that is something that you really want to look into. And these are really the things you guys, I know as business owners, we wear like a bajillion hats and there's so many things to learn and do, but this is the part of your business where you make the money. So this is the part of your business that you really want to go through with a fine tooth comb and be like, all right, am I actually, are 90% of my people falling off the planet after I send that first email? I probably need to update copy. Are people not actually converting to a paid, you know, a paid proposal after the consult? I probably need to fix that consultation process. So it's really easy to see when you're measuring these things where the holes are, if you're not ever looking at your HoneyBook reports or if you have like spreadsheets where you're measuring these things or you don't have spreadsheets, it's really hard to see where these holes are. Um, So these in the inquiry process are really going to be where you're leaving money on the table or clients and stuff like that. So that is the leaky bucket concept in the inquiry form. And I wanna ask you guys, what would be possible for you if you knew you had these holes in your bucket where people aren't converting to a client or you're not getting them to a consult? What would be possible for you either revenue wise or just like how would this improve your lifestyle if you were able to fix those holes all together? Because it is something like I'm obsessed with this in my business and I I'm I'm working on a group coaching program for next year that this concept is just going to come into play so much with where are you leaking money? Where are you leaking client referrals? Where are you leaking time? And really helping business owners run like a very well-oiled business. And this is something that's like so, so important in your inquiry process. So I hope that just gives you some things to think about um, because we don't want to We don't want to just throw duct tape on. We want a like actual good bucket without holes. (laughs) Um, So then we are going to transition back to Mac. So that was my part three leaky bucket. Um, Actually, Mac, do you want, you want to do your pipeline here, right? And then I'll go into the inquiry process. Yeah. Yeah. I think that'd be good. Cause yeah, I think this is like a really good opportunity to just kind of talk through visibility that HoneyBook offers. So beyond just the pipeline, we've been talking about, um, you know, the reports that you can look at. So we can take a brief look at those. Um, And I even kind of want to tease to the automations and workflows that we've been touching on so much, because I think I would be remiss if I left you guys without showing you where to do that. So 
In terms of visibility, and I, I think honestly, outside of just the ease of communication that HoneyBook provides, probably the bigger value add that comes from using a system like HoneyBook is just the very low maintenance visibility that it provides into your business and letting you know honestly, without even like really lifting a finger where those holes in your process are because of things like the HoneyBook pipeline, the reports that it offers, um, and all the other different features that are available. So just to start out, this is the HoneyBook pipeline. So this is in your projects tab. Um, so most of you guys are familiar probably already with this concept that the projects in HoneyBook are really just reflecting the different jobs that you're taking on. And this pipeline here up at the top is just breaking down all of those jobs into the stages of your process. Now, one key kind of confusion point that Laura and I run into when we're working with HoneyBook members is differentiating between workflows in HoneyBook or automations and the, all the little touch points and steps that go on in there and the HoneyBook pipeline. So just to quickly define that for you guys, um, workflows is really and workflows and automations is really more of those nitty gritty step points of following up with clients and the messaging and the the really kind of high touch points that need to go into following up with clients and making sure that their needs are met and expectations are met and all those things that is workflows and automations is really case by case um automatic follow-ups with your clients now the pipeline is really more high level bird's eye view of specifically your booking process. So inquiry to, you know, are they kind of in that follow-up stage? The follow-up stage could, you know, this follow-up stage here could mean that they're in a 20-step follow-up workflow with you, but you're not necessarily going to see that from the pipeline, um, from the bird's eye view, because this is just telling you, hey, these people are still kind of in your process of figuring out if you guys are a good fit. So the pipeline, again, is giving you that bird's eye view of you're still kind of in the evaluation stage, whereas once you actually click into the project itself, you would be able to get a glimpse of the workflow and all the steps that are in there. So the pipeline is really just meant to help you track from your inquiry process through booking and beyond. So there are some automations here in the HoneyBook pipeline, the first of which is gonna be that inquiry stage, which we've been talking about with the contact form. So as soon as your client fills out that contact form, their information is added into the HoneyBook system here in the inquiry stage of the HoneyBook pipeline. Um, so all of these folks have not heard from you yet. So HoneyBook will track once you've sent at least one message to them, whether that be through an automatic workflow or not. Once you've at least reached out one time, HoneyBook will automatically move that project to the follow-up stage for you. So that's the first automation here is HoneyBook is gonna help you decipher who's not heard from you yet. So this is very much ball is in your court to have a touch point. And this is the perfect opportunity and reason why you should have a HoneyBook workflow for your inquiry process, because that is a huge leaky bucket part that you can have in your process. So it's really important to address that, um, especially if you're someone who gets a lot of inquiries with an automatic workflow um, that can help you manage those follow-ups. But HoneyBook will automatically move it to the follow-up stage once you've at least sent one message. And then once you've hit send on a bookable file, which traditionally in HoneyBook is the proposal file, because that's going to combine the invoice and contract into one booking document. So if you're someone who collects payment and signature on the same day, that is the file you should be using. So as soon as you hit send on that, HoneyBook will automatically track it and update that stage for you as well once your client signs it and once your client pays it. So when we're talking about visibility in your business here, the HoneyBook pipeline is hugely powerful and beneficial in helping you understand where clients are dropping off, where bottlenecks are in your business, or like Laura has been talking about where those leaky aspects of your bucket are, right? Because if you have a ton of people like I do who are in my inquiry stage who I've not reached out to yet, that makes me think, okay, this is an opportunity for me to automate my inquiry process because I need help picking up with those people who are inquiring all the time and they're waiting days to hear from me. That's not the experience I want to give my clients. So right away, this visibility tells me I need to create an, an inquiry workflow. Um, or if you see, again, like in my example here, I've hit send on 20 proposals, but for some reason, those people haven't signed the contract and paid. So maybe that's room where I could maybe set more clear expectations or maybe 
I don't have a consult call in my process and I'm realizing that people actually probably do want to get on the phone with me before they, um, you know, go ahead and sign a contract with me or something like that. So this is just really good kind of thought process to walk yourself through as you look at the different stages here. Really quickly, before I pass back to Laura, I want to point out the reporting section that we were talking about. And you guys bear with me because this is our demo account, so it might not be the most beautiful chart you've ever seen in your life, but let's take a look. So this down here is the lead source report that we were talking about. So this shows you across your funnel where your leads are coming from. So this is that question that we added to the contact form earlier of how did you hear about us? It's that suggested question type for lead source. So you can, again, customize these lead sources. So in Julia's example, we had talked about, you know, maybe there's two people that she's frequently getting referrals from and she wants to add them by name here to this report. So you can do that and then it'll track where all your leads are coming from, the value of those leads. So how many of them actually end up booking with you and what their value is, conversion rate, how long it took them to book. Um, different things like that. So this lead source report is hugely powerful in knowing leaky buckets in terms of where your leads are coming from. So this is a great, very low calorie way to add that question to your contact form and have HoneyBook produce that visibility into your business and your inquiries and where they're coming from. Okay, last final bit that I promised you guys is workflows before I pass back to Laura. So workflows is what we've been kind of alluding to and what I said we'll be covering in a lot more detail in workshop three and four, which are next Tuesday and Thursday next week. So you guys can register for those, but the idea with workflows is those automatic steps that we were talking about. So you can click in from the tools tab. It'll show you the number of steps that you have, and this is where you can automate via the contact form. So this dropdown is showing me the option to automate based off of my project types, which is what we were talking about earlier with Julia, how she could set up her project types to reflect the different grades of students and ages of students that she works with. So this is where she would be able to automate grade 12 maybe versus grade nine and lower. So you can check multiple boxes here if your demographic is similar and you wanna address those in a similar fashion with similar messaging and steps, or maybe you just wanna silo out a specific project type or demographic of client that you work with to automate those people on an individual basis. Or you can say, hey, everyone who fills out my contact form, I want them to go through this workflow. So you have different options there, but this is where you control that. And then I'm not going to go into it right now, but you can click into these workflows to view the steps in your process and edit any of these steps. This is what Laura was talking about when she was talking about a number of days after a certain step. So this is where you can control all of that. If this is singing your song, don't forget to register for workshop three and four, because this is really what we're going to be covering in those later discussions. All righty, that was a lot. <laughs> Let me pass it back to you, Laura. <laughs> All right, last section, you guys. Okay, so I am going to dive into the inquiry process and how to help you fix any holes that you have here of just converting the inquiry into a booking. So I'm just gonna give like, some tips here. It's going to be pretty basic since all of our inquiry process and consults are going to be a little different. But once that contact form is filled out, your official inquiry process begins. And just like the pre-inquiry process, it is vitally important that we create a great customer experience, a relationship with our potential clients, differentiate ourselves, give proof of our value during the inquiry and follow-up processes. So I want to break down how we can actually do this. And again, being in an era where a lot of our ideal clients are millennials means that we need to be fast, we need to be personal. And so I will go over a few of those general tips. So number one is to make contact that helps you stand out. And this, for me, I call all of my inquiries or I send a video message or I text them. And this might seem super scary to people. People are like, especially introverts. So like, oh my God, I don't want to call people. No, 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 don't make me. Um, but 
they reached out for more information. So it's not a cold call, I promise you. And people are so appreciative. Um, sometimes I've even had like hour to two hour long text conversations at like nine o'clock at night with potential wedding inquiries. And I'm like, this is so fun. Like, oh my gosh, you ski too? Like, she'll be like, oh, I want to talk next week. My fiance is on a ski trip in Utah. I'm like, oh my gosh, I ski. And then we just like go down this whole route habit hole. And so I'm making a connection before I ever even have a consultation about the actual service. And I started doing calls in 2017. And my booking rates drastically started going up. Like we're talking, you know, maybe 10 to 20% from an email to like 80 to 90% to the people that I actually called. And uh, pro tip, if they are not an ideal client for your service, just don't call them. You can still send an email. Um, But those calls for me personally, because we just have a set cap for how many clients we can take on, especially for weddings. Um, I don't call everybody if it's a venue that I might be too far for me, or if I'm not available, obviously I won't call them. Um, I'll still send them an email, but that would be my first tip to call or send a video message or a text message. And really the whole goal of this is to make a personal connection, let them hear your voice. And it can be a one to two minute conversation. Most of the time, literally just saying like, Hey, it's Laura. I'm so excited. I got your inquiry for your wedding and I can't wait to chat with yesterday. I called somebody who's getting married at the same venue that I am this June. So we connected on that and she booked a call for this Thursday. And a lot of times it'll be easier to just book a call verbally over the phone and not even send a scheduler link. So you can kind of skip that whole first step. And so that would be my first tip. So just make sure that however you are contacting them is standing out. And if you are sending inquiry emails and you're not getting a whole lot of response, then this would be where I would look first. Tip number two would be to respond fast. And luckily, HoneyBook has an app. So if you are on HoneyBook and you have yourself logged in, that was my mistake for a really long time. I forgot to log into the app on my phone, so I wasn't getting inquiry notifications to my phone. But if you have the app, make sure you log in and turn notifications on, and then you'll get notified that you have an inquiry. Your, your inquiry workflow can automatically apply if you have that contact form connected to it. And then you can literally choose your inquiry email template, click send, and off we go. So you can literally do it on the beach at a coffee shop, like wherever you are, you can do that. But I would highly recommend responding fast. I forget the exact stat, but I think it was like, you have a, I don't know, like a 5x, or I think it was like 7x more um, seven X chance of booking somebody if you respond within like the first hour or two. So I don't know if that's the exact stat. It was like a couple years ago. It was HubSpot stat. Um, but super, super important to respond fast. Don't take a couple days. If you have an inquiry template, it also makes it way, way, way easier. Um, so that would be simple. Tip number two, in my personal experience, 24 hours is too long. Um, and especially in this day and age, just think of like Amazon, we can literally get our packages in like hours after we, depending on where you live, you can literally get it like an hour after you order it, you can get your groceries delivered. So you need to Amazon like set the bar way too high for small business owners that have a million things to do and like families to take care of. But unfortunately, that is kind of the standard that has been set. So I always like to think like, all right, we live in an, I always say we live in an Amazon prime world. So that's how I need to also respond to my inquiries. Um, and so number three, be direct. We already touched on this a little bit, but be direct in your questions or your call to action so that they know the very clear next steps. I literally put in my inquiry email, next steps and like big heading three text bolded and underlined and then it says like book a consult call and it's linked in a different color so i am very like visually showing them exactly what to do so they cannot miss it um and i will put this in text messages too sometimes if i send an email before i call or text i will shoot them a text and just say like 
Hey Janet, so excited to get your brand inquiry. I just wanted to let you know I sent you a email just in case your inbox is crazy like so many other people I know. I just wanted to let you know to look out for that. I sent a link to schedule a consult. Can't wait to hear more about your project. So that would be um, something that I also do as well. And then I wanted to real quick go into dissecting the inquiry email. And of course, this is going to be a little bit different depending on whatever service you provide. But I wanted to kind of give a bare bones, like skeletal structure of most good service providers first point of contact email. So after you receive the inquiry, first two steps would be call the client and email them or text them. And this is what I would recommend including in the copy of the email. First one I would say is personal information. Well, I would say excitement for them and about their project, any specific things that they mentioned. So for me as a wedding photographer, if they mentioned the venue, I actually ask the venue in their contact form so I know how far I'm traveling or if I have a double header. If they ask that, I also want to include that in, in my response back so that it shows I'm not just sending a 100% generic email template. I am using something that's 95% of the way there, but then I'm customizing it to what they put in their contact form. So share excitement for them about their project, customize that a little bit to whatever they shared. And then I always like to share personal information that might be one of my brand connection points. So like somebody, I think Allison said like, oh my God, Laura, you adopted an elephant. I literally have that in my inquiry form to couples. Um, something I was doing, I didn't do it during the pandemic just because obviously cash flow was like way different than a normal year. But I used to donate a portion of all of my wedding profits to a wildlife trust fund in Kenya. And so I used to include that too, like, um, just, you know, know where your money's going and what it's supporting. So I would share some of that personal information, but then I would go into how I am here to help them make their vision for their project come to life and what my kind of unique differentiator, differentiators are to help them do that. And then I always, um, I don't include social proof in that first email, but this is what I would start to put in those follow-up emails of like, hey, I know that as a millennial myself or as somebody who really takes the time to research my options before booking somebody, I know that testimonials are important. Then I'll share testimonials in those follow-up emails. And they're already created as like a canned email template in my HoneyBook and connected in my workflow. So I just have to hit view, edit, and send. Um, but then I will have pretty much three, um, two links in there for them. One is my pricing guide if they haven't seen it yet. And then two times in my email, I say like, your next step is to book a consult with me. And I link that scheduler link in there with a direct question or a, re well, right now I'm not meeting in person. Um, but if they are local, in a future pandemic world, I can meet them in person for coffee or something like that. So that's kind of a breakdown of my first email. So excitement, customize for their project, share a little bit of personal information and those brand connection points and how you can help make their project come to life, your pricing guide if they haven't seen it already, and then a direct question to call to action, schedule a consultation with you, recommended with a scheduler link, so that you don't have to go back and forth via email. And I know we're not getting into workflows, but since it's what I teach, I want to just show you guys start to finish what every word vomit I've been giving to you guys actually looks like in a workflow. So my inquiry workflow, start to finish, um, that first optional one is send, setting up a autoresponder email that would go out as soon as the workflow is applied, just saying like, you'll receive a human response um, in the next couple hours. I can't wait to chat. So that's my first optional one. You can screenshot this, feel free if you want. Um, my first one after that is to call them and say I'm excited about their project if I am. Send an email that I'm available for their project if I am, and that includes uh, my Calendly or my scheduler link. And then after that, if 
most of the time I don't have to, I actually should delete this one because um, I don't send it anymore with that scheduler option now, but I used to have an email that would be like setting up a time to call and it would have another link in there. Um, but sometimes if I, most of the time I'll only send that if I got a phone call, like the Gen Xers that are reaching out to have newborn photos for their grandkids. They always call me. They never send through my contact form. I'm always like, who am I, who's calling me for my business? Um, my dad's always like, your voicemail's full. I'm like, nobody calls. It's fine. Um, but <laughs> I will send that email of like setting up a time to call if I got it manually through like a call or the nod or something like that. And then I'll just add that to my calendar if I had to do it manually. So I just have those steps to remind me. Then I have a consultation with the client. I send a thank you for speaking on the call email after my meeting. And then if they do not book within 48 hours, I send two meeting follow-up emails. So again, this is where Mac was talking about on the pipeline where you might have leaky holes, like that was a demo account that 20 proposals had been sent out. But if you see that those proposals aren't actually turning into a booking, this is where you can start to plug those holes is sending an email following up after meeting num email number one, email number two, those emails for myself, one would be like selling our services. <laughs> I said selling self, but it should have been selling services and like saying why we are different and showing our unique value. And then I also send one, this is kind of like reverse psychology, but I say, for wedding specifically booking advice, if they don't book me and I give them tips on what to look for in a wedding photographer and I say like, even if I'm not the right fit, I just want to provide a great service for you. And so it's almost like reverse psychology and saying like, no, 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 I'm not the best fit for everybody. And then they're just like, no, no, we want, we want to work with you. Um, so that's uh, my second email after, again, these are both after a consult and then last contact for, uh, wedding after meeting or whatever your service is. So those are after a meeting. And then in HoneyBook, Matt kind of started to share a little bit on that inquiry of what those triggers can be. I call these independent tasks. So they are not necessarily triggered like a domino one after the other. They're more towards the end of like a optional task if they didn't answer. So I put all of my follow-up emails at the bottom of my workflow. So I have follow up three days after. Um, then we have a follow up five days after with testimonials, follow up seven days after. And for my wedding clients, this is where I'll send blog posts or galleries for them to go through that are similar style to their wedding type. And then I closing the inquiry and then I archive dead leads after that. So my pipeline is not filled with people who never contacted me. So your take action for this final section is to Make sure you have a killer about page on your, oh, sorry, I already said that one, um, deleted my notes here. Um, update your contact form as needed. Set up your contact form to go straight to your CRM to help automate the inquiry and workflow process and connect that to your inquiry workflow. So create an inquiry workflow if you don't have one. Um, practice a mock phone call or a video message to a client. You can literally practice with a friend if this is something that you've never done before. I know it can be scary the first time. Um, write or rewrite an inquiry email template using the tips provided. And then you can also create a brochure and add your packages into HoneyBook or your CRM and work on a follow-up series that is going to be more robust than like, hey, just following up on your inquiry. Um, like to tell them about you, especially if they have been reaching out to multiple people, you want to really provide value in those follow-up emails. So it's not just like generic and they're like, wait, who are you? Can you remind me? Um, so providing a really awesome follow-up series so that you are plugging those holes, not leaving money on the table and write a meeting follow-up series as well. And of course, pretty much everything that we've talked about can be done within HoneyBook. And there is an app, which I love. I literally, when I set up my workflows the, for the first time, it was in 2016, end of 2016, going into 2017, I took July and November off. Mind you, I'm in New Jersey. So my wedding season is from May to November. I took all of July and all of November off. I was literally on a beach and I was able to run my business in like 10 minutes a day on the HoneyBook app 
diaphragm of each chair. So you can really do almost everything on the app, which is amazing. And we just use it when we're on the go to manage every part of our business. And for 200 projects. So there is a lot of tasks to manage and having that workflow set up and all of these client experience touch points just helps us stay on top of things, not let things slip through the cracks. So definitely register for any of the workshops that are on workflow and task management, because if you're not using it, you need to be and your life will be changed. People like their minds get blown. And of course, if you need help with setting that up, I can help you. Um, but these are some resources for you. The concierge team is amazing at Honeybook, so you can email them with any questions. And then here's a link for any weekly webinars that are going to be happening too on project education. So that is it. If you guys have yeah, any questions. Yeah, I, I wrote down some of the questions as they were coming in that we didn't have the time to go through. So one of the first questions that we got that we um, didn't have a chance to address which we've only got three minutes left here. So maybe let's do these rapid fire. Um, so someone says, do you think brochures have to have pricing? So right off the bat, I'm going to tell you that on Thursday, we have our workshop where we're talking about brochures majority of the time. So today we're talking mostly about visibility and contact form. Thursdays is going to be all about branding, pricing, brochures, and all of that good stuff. So if that's what interests you, I highly recommend just registering for the workshop that's gonna be on Thursday. But Laura, do you have a quick answer for this? I would say they don't have to. It can be more of an info guide. Like think of it kind of like a PDF that you would create in Canva, but you can literally do it directly in HoneyBook. So it does not need to have pricing. Mine actually doesn't. We have pricing on our website that is like all fully branded and I had created it years ago and I was like, I don't want to redo this. So um, <laughs> we do not have pricing in our brochures. Perfect. More of an info guide. Yeah. Yeah. And this, that actually kind of answers another question that somebody said, um, do you recommend having pricing on your website? I have a link to book a call to apply to work before going over the pricing, but do you think I should have pricing on my website too? I would say just having an average investment is a good idea so that you're not getting people that are way, way below your budget um, because we don't want to waste their time or your time. So I don't have all of my packages on my website, but I say the average investment clients spend is between X and X. Yep. Great. And I see people asking about the links to register for the webinars. I'll post those as soon as we wrap up here this morning, just so I don't waste time answering um, or not answering these questions that were coming through. One of the bigger questions that people had, Laura, was about lengthy emails. Like, what's your opinion on sending wordy emails? They feel bad that they're sending too long of an email. What's what's the magic length? Is there a word count? What's your advice? I say there's no such thing as boring emails or boring sales pages. Or sorry, no such thing as too long emails or too long of sales pages. Just boring ones. So if you can increase your writing ability by like hooking them in and bringing them into a story or providing value to them and not just like blabbing forever about yourself and bringing it back to them all the time, um, then it should not be a problem that it's long. Mine are pretty long. Like bre me and my assistant always joke that brevity is not my strong suit yeah. at all. I'm like, here's the seven paragraph essay about why I'm so excited to work with you. <laughs> I love it. Okay, guys, that is time. So um, we are going to wrap it up. I know you guys had some other questions. So um, I will try to stay on and answer those questions that you guys post in the question chat. And then I am also going to post the link to the upcoming workshops that we have going on. Um, like I said, this was recorded. So if you want to be able to come back and watch it, um, you can just bookmark the link above. Laura, thank you so much for helping yes. us out. This was, like I said, you went above and beyond on this. We covered everything from start to finish. So hopefully you guys um, were able to get some tips and tricks today. So thank you for joining us. I know this was an hour and a half workshop. So really appreciate everyone's time this morning. Yeah, this was so fun. And if you guys have any questions for me, you can reach out. Um, my email and my Instagram is on there. And I'm always happy to answer. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.